Good evening. Thank you all for having me here today. Thank you, Phil, for the generous introduction. And thank you to all the faculty for inviting me to UCI. Uh, thank you all for coming to hear me on this uh, Wednesday, Thursday afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work I've been doing over the past few years. Uh, most recently, this was a book that came out in 2015. Uh, that looks at what we refer to as the third wave of African protests. Uh, but I'm also just going to talk about how things have transpired since the book came out, um, since obviously there have been a lot of developments in this area since we first started working on this book back in 2012. Um, some just sort of guiding questions that I want to put up here to kind of orient our conversation for today. Uh, first, why has Africa been left out of conversations about protests worldwide? Uh, this is, a, I think, an important issue. Many of you may not even be aware that Africa has been undergoing a, a major wave of protests since about 2005 uh, that has coincided with protests much more prominent, such as the Arab Spring, uh, protests like Occupy Wall Street, protests like Black Lives Matter. Uh, concurrently, there have been all these protests in Africa, but rarely do we think about these protests that are unfolding in places like North America or Europe or even Latin America and situate them alongside the African protests. And what I'm going to try to suggest today uh, is that protest movements around the world have a lot they could learn if they were paying more attention to the African context. Uh, and then I'm going to describe a little bit about what is the third wave of African protests, as we call it, uh, and why it has emerged at this precise moment. Uh, very importantly here, and I think it's a very central theme to what we try to do in the book, is to try to answer a basic question about what makes African protests distinctive. In order to do this, I'm going to try to trace one possible history of African protests going back to the anti-colonial struggles and continuing from that period on to today uh, to try to discern what I think are some of the unique features that have defined African protests across time. Uh, and then, as I already sort of hinted at, what can be learned? I, I don't study African protests simply because I'm interested in Africa, though I am, uh, but also because I think that Africans, uh, through protest, have gleaned many important insights about the nature of our politics and economics in this current moment that we can all learn from uh, regardless of where we are in the world. All right? uh, just very briefly on terms of what we did for the book and how I've tried to do this, uh, as I already mentioned. We will sort of look back historically, uh, beginning in the 1940s and 1950s, with what's referred to as the first wave of African protest, uh, and then continuing through the 1980s and 1990s when there was a second major outbreak of protest, uh, to try to look at a number of key debates that define these earlier waves of African protest and how they relate to what's happening today. Um, in the book, we look at protest movements in four countries, but I'm just going to talk about a variety of different protest movements, including uh, some recent ones that have been unfolding. Uh, we also look at it quantitatively to try to see how broad this phenomenon is, and I'll show you some of the data that we gathered there. And then I think most relevant in terms of my more recent work uh, is, you know, as a result of this book, and I'm happy to talk about this, uh, I have been approached by a number of African social movements uh, to help them try to work on a, a network of African social movements that is referred to as a freaky. Uh, and a lot of the research that I'm doing now is not really research, it's more just being involved with these different movements uh, through kind of my uh, intellectual work, but also I think uh, my interest in, in kind of using this intellectual work to try to actually shape politics in different parts of the world. Okay, so that's all the, the preliminary. Let me just go back here now to some of the intellectual uh, precedence for this project. Uh, most of you are probably familiar that in the context of African anti-colonial struggles, there were a large variety of protests that unfolded basically between the 1940s and 1960s, essentially uh, in the aftermath of World War II when the European imperial system was collapsing, right? Uh, much of it inspired by uh, protests that started in places like South Asia, India in particular, but then very quickly were modified and adapted to the African context. Um, there were a number of key figures who emerged during this period, uh, but perhaps the two most seminal figures are Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who was the leader of the uh, independence movement in what was then known as the Gold Coast and is now referred to as Ghana. Uh, and on the other side, a man named Franz Fanon, who was actually a Martinican intellectual from the Caribbean, uh, but who became a seminal figure in terms of theorizing the limits of protest in the African context. And one of the key debates uh, that these two figures had, and I mean, when I say debates, I don't mean just intellectually, they actually debated in the same spaces uh, in a variety of different venues around Africa around the relative efficacy of nonviolent action uh, versus armed struggle, right? uh, with Fanon suggesting that nonviolent action was limited and Nkrumah suggesting that nonviolent action was the only route through which Africans could achieve 
independence. Right? And I'll come back to this question of violence versus nonviolence because I'm guessing for most of you when you think about youth political action in the African context it evokes uh, <laughs> images of violent armed groups. And actually most of my original work and continues uh, is on the subject of violent resistance. Right? But what has been unfolding and what has always accompanied uh, this question of the, 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 uh, the utility a violent struggle has always been the possibility of nonviolent resistance as well. And so these two things, this uh, dialectic, as it were, between nonviolence and, and violence, has long existed in terms of debates within Africa uh, around how to bring about political transformation. So I'll come back to this because I think it's a very seminal issue. Um, what you see out of the first 1940s, uh, 1950s protests is actually tremendously uh, impactful on the trajectory of Africa. Uh, ever since. It, from this period of 1957, when Ghana becomes the first country uh, in, in, well, in so-called black Africa uh, to gain its independence, all the way through the 1970s, right, is that you have these widespread protest movements and they're very successful uh, in leading to the formal independence of African <laughs> states, right? So if you look at, uh, in the 1950s, almost all of Africa, except for, say, Ethiopia, uh, are under European imperial domination. By the early 1960s, um, the vast majority of Africa is free, save for a few colonies in the southern part of the continent. Uh, yet this doesn't lead to kind of the utopian world that many of the <coughs> participants in these protest movements were hoping for. Right? Uh, Nkrumah in particular uh, emerges as roughly a strongman. He confronts a number of challenges. And so despite leading this very inspirational, nonviolent struggle to bring the Gold Coast to independence, uh, it very quickly devolves into an authoritarian regime uh, that relies very heavily on the military to enforce uh, control over the population. And eventually Nkrumah himself uh, is displaced in a, in a military coup. Uh, this is a process that unfolds in many different parts of Africa during this period. So despite the success of the protest movements, the kinds the political transformations that they brought uh, are not a democratic utopia, but rather uh, militarized nationalism. Right? Um, and if you look at this empirically, you can see that across Africa, from the period of the 1960s when most African countries become independent until the 1990s, only three countries in Africa were even remotely democratic in any sense. Almost the vast majority of the continent was under varying forms of authoritarian rule. Just a picture of Kwame Nkrumah, just to give you a sense of the scale of his protest. Uh, that's Nkrumah, obviously, in the car in the middle here. And he was able to mobilize these large uh, populations of what were referred to as the Randa boys. These are essentially young men uh, who, uh, you know, under colonial rule, were not able to find employment in colonial labor economies. Uh, and were always a major threat against colonial domination. And they had a number of riots in the 1940s and 1950s that Nkrumah essentially came in and pacified, basically saying to the British colonial authorities, either you negotiate with my nonviolent movement or I will let loose these boys on your government and you will face the consequences of it. Right? So that threat of violence always accompanied uh, the promise of nonviolent action. All right, just to move quickly into the 1980s and 1990s, these were a set of protests really fascinating that haven't really received uh, enough attention into the current period uh, that started to unfold in the 1980s, really in 1985 with protests in Sudan, um, and then really started to escalate by the late 1980s with the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, some of you may be familiar that throughout the Cold War, Africa was a major site of contestation between the two superpowers, the United States on one side and the Soviet Union on the other. Uh, and this led to some degree of stability that really collapsed with the fall of the Soviet Union. During this period, uh, you had many African states which could no longer kind of vacillate between the two sides of the two great superpowers. Uh, and suddenly, many of these regimes that had been very authoritarian, but somewhat stable because of their support from the superpowers, started to collapse in the face uh, of popular protests. Right? And many of these protests emerged in these countries because they were subjected to a variety of shock treatments to their economies. Uh, as the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, these economies were no longer able to rely on the Soviets to sponsor them, and they were subjected to some very brutal austerity programs by the international financial institutions, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in particular. And this triggered a, a whole array uh, of popular protests across uh, Africa, uh, beginning in Sudan, as I mentioned, but spreading very quickly westward, uh, so that by 1990, there were popular uprisings in 14 African countries alone. Um, 
And what it led to was actually a really interesting process, right? Essentially, as a result of these popular movements uh, and the instability that they were able to create, a number of incumbents decided that they would allow, uh, well, they had no choice, really. They, they stepped down, and a process of what were referred to as sovereign national conferences took place. These were essentially large gatherings that tried to select representatives from all over the society, so women's associations, peasants' groups, students, labor unions, uh, human rights activists, journalists were all brought into a single space and allowed to talk about what sort of constitution each of these countries should have. Right? They were called the sovereign national conferences because during these conferences, the conference participants declared the conferences to be sovereign. Not the constitution, not the government, but the representatives in the conference themselves. And what they hoped to accomplish was to rewrite their constitutions in ways that genuinely represented the will of the people. Right? Um, Unfortunately, what happened is that you had a variety of opposition figures who kind of stepped to the forefront of these processes and essentially took these broad demands for radical economic and political transformations and suggested that what we really want is electoral competition, right? multi-parties. So what began as a very sort of promising inspirational process again devolved into a very sort of narrow demand for uh, multi-party politics. Right? Uh, and if you look at it again, you know, if the first wave of African protests brought around independence, uh, the second wave of uh, African protests had a similarly impactful, uh, 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 similar impact on the nature of African politics. Uh, if in the 1990s there were only three African democracies, within 20 years you have something like 20 African democracies. These are uh, based on kind of the holding of formal elections. <laughs> Uh, and another 20 which were actually holding elections even if they weren't considered to be democratic according to the, uh, the formal organizations that, that try to measure these dynamics. Most prominently a group called Freedom House. And what you see if you look at the data that Freedom House has put forward, uh, 2007 actually represents kind of the high point of formal democracy in Africa. Right. Uh, you have uh, many, many countries that are meeting the qualifications for what constitutes democracy, but ever since then, uh, it has been in retreat. Right. Um, which brings us to the current moment. Oh, just one more image here. This is one of the signs that was held up by protesters in the 1990s. And you can see uh, the notion of austerity and the sense that the international financial institutions were causing widespread poverty in the African context had triggered a mass, massive sense of outrage amongst many Africans. You know, it's, what's interesting here, I think, is you know, these sorts of debates about the impacts of austerity have been unfolding in the African context until the 1990s. And most of you, if you've grown up in the West, whether Western Europe or North America, notions of austerity didn't really start to enter into the debate until really the late 2000s. Right? So in many ways, Africans have been ahead of the curve uh, in critiquing austerity programs uh, than, say, people in Greece and other European countries that have similarly started to protest austerity measures. Okay, brings us to the third wave, which I want to talk about, uh, I want to focus on. Uh, and for us, we really sort of trace the beginning of these protests to 2005, uh, when you had a series of protests in Ethiopia uh, that were massively repressed by the government in that country. Uh, and more recently, you've seen these protests pretty much everywhere in Africa. Uh, if you look at it empirically, you can see from the data we gathered uh, that these sorts of popular protests have unfolded in every part of Africa, uh, in every region of Africa, including the north. Um, what is often referred to as the Arab Spring, but as I'll show you, uh, that's a misnomer for a variety of reasons. Uh, most of these emerge around specific electoral or economic crises, and this is often what leads them to be mischaracterized in terms of the content of the protests. Right? Many people suggest that these are simply electoral protests. Are there bread riots? Right? This is the language through which we talk about them. We diminish their overall political significance by labeling them in these ways. And what I want to suggest is that they are often triggered by electoral or economic crises, but they actually quickly take on a much bigger scale. Uh, and again, in terms of why we don't pay attention to them, many of these do not necessarily articulate clear agendas. They're often disorganized. Uh, many of them do not necessarily respect the idea of nonviolent action. Uh, they often will descend into violence. You have very commonly uh, protests that target uh, physical property uh, in ways that easily lead them to be dismissed as riots. Right? So in Sudan, for example, some of you may have been paying attention to the recent protests there. Uh, but multiple times during those protests, uh, protesters attacked uh, gas stations, right? which was a, a sign of the regime which drew most of its wealth from its control over the gas trade. Uh, 
Um, and very quickly, the regime used that as a way to discredit the protests by suggesting that they were not protest at all, but rather the action of gangs or engaged in rioting. And I think at a bigger level, uh, there is a kind of general bias against taking seriously African protest. Uh, we have an image of Africa in our heads that suggests that Africa is a place uh, of villages, right? that it's too rural, uh, that, that Africa is simply too poor, that people in Africa are too tribally minded uh, to engage in popular protest at all. Right? And so even in the face of all this evidence that we've marshaled around the prevalence of African protests and the impact of African protests, both historically and today, uh, there is still a pretty strong resistance to recognizing the centrality of protest to African politics today. And importantly, I think, for those of us who support the, uh, the, the role of protest in democratic life, uh, the idea that we have anything to learn by studying African protests. All right, just to give you a sense of where these protests are unfolding, here is a list from our book of all the protests that we were able to document, uh, going back, as you'll notice, to 2006 or 2005 in Ethiopia, uh, and then continuing. Here it's just sort of graphed, uh, these are the protests we documented in the book from 2005 to 2014. The main thing I want to just point out here is if you look at 2011, the year of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, it wasn't simply the four North African countries that were experiencing protests during this period, but in fact, 26 countries in Africa had large-scale popular uprisings in 2011 alone, right? Uh, and as you see, 2011 wasn't the start of the wave, but in many ways, a crest. Uh, so it's more appropriate to talk about the North African protest in the broader context of African protest, right? Rather than divorcing North Africa from the rest of the continent and suggesting that it is uh, somehow distinctive. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about what's driving these current uh, protests, right? On one side, some of you may be aware that after many decades of, of pretty substandard growth, uh, African economies have been growing fairly rapidly over the past two decades. Uh, you've seen uh, some of the highest growth rates in the world in African countries, but this is a generalized phenomenon. African countries are growing uh, wholesale across the continent. You see pretty robust economic growth uh, uh, surpassing 3% until fairly recently. Much of this is not hard to understand. It's largely been driven by the massive influx of investment from Asian countries, particularly China, uh, into African economies. And uh, since 1990, for example, uh, there are more imports and exports going to Asia from Africa than to its historical trading partners, which is the EU and North America. Right? Asia is now, in other words, a more important economic partner for most African countries uh, than the West. Right? But here's the thing about the nature of Asian investment, or Chinese investment in particular, uh, in the African context. Right? Uh, the kind of typical model for how economists in particular believe that growth and development occur uh, is that you bring in foreign direct investment and that this leads to a process of industrialization. Right? And as working class people start to get jobs in formal industries, they are able to uh, rise up out of poverty and become developed. That's the standard narrative that even organizations like the World Bank and IMF are constantly putting forward, and that is why there's a constant fetishization around the need for foreign direct investment. What's happened in Africa is actually really interesting in that it's actually led to a process of deindustrialization. Right? Rather than African economies becoming more industrialized over time as a result of all this investment, uh, there's actually been a decline in manufacturing and a decline in formal jobs. Why is this occurring? Well, it's because almost all of the Asian investment into African economies uh, is con concentrated in the commodity sector. Right? Uh, and the commodity sector is a primarily rural phenomenon and doesn't necessarily lead to the industrialization of the workforce. Right? So Africa actually had higher rates of industrialization in terms of the share of the workforce employed in the industrial sector in the 1980s than it does today. Right. Pretty extraordinary job. What this means is, is that there's been a massive uh, informalization of labor across the African context, and so many young people, even those who have educations, are unable to find jobs that are commensurate with their qualifications. Yeah? In other words, there has been a massive growth in uh, overall GDP figures in the African context, but no overall reduction in poverty. And this is not my uh, opinion, this is actually the World Bank's own uh, estimate of what's been happening in Africa over the past two decades. Okay, so political factors. Uh, the youth bulge, right? 
Um, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. It is also the continent with the greatest age gap between the people and the leaders. Right? Africa has a lot of very, very, very old leaders. Um, and it is also growing at the fastest rate in the world. The population is expected to hit 2 billion in the next 30 years, which would make it a larger share of the global population than China, India, and other countries, which are actually slowing down in terms of their population. Uh, Africa is urbanizing very rapidly. Right? Currently, 60% of the population in Africa remains rural, but it is dropping fast. African cities are growing at an extraordinary pace. This is also related to the commodities boom that I mentioned earlier, in that many people are being pushed off of their traditional homelands and moving into the cities, where they're not absorbed into any sort of formal labor force, but are rather pushed into the informal economy. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, uh, Africa's urban population now is roughly comparable to India today. Right? So Africa is as urbanized as India, even though we think of Africa as still being populated by villages. Um, politically, again, I think one of the key points that, that we sort of look at in the book is that the nature of African democratization that has unfolded since the 1990s uh, has been characterized by what, we, what political scientists sometimes refer to as electoral authoritarianism, what the Malawian scholar economist Tandika Mkandawile referred to in the 1990s as choiceless democracies, right? So you have uh, a, a fairly robust set of electoral institutions, you have uh, political parties, you have something like a press, but none of these are operating independently. Uh, they are completely co-opted uh, by elites in many of these countries, right? And so many people in the African context feel that even as there are regular elections, they don't actually have a choice, right? Some of you uh, who live in the United States may recognize this feeling. Um, and again, you, know, you see on paper a very strong increase in formal democratic institutions, but little substantive change. Right? Uh, you have these political parties, you have all the, the hallmarks uh, of democracy, uh, but you don't have very democratic outcomes. And that, I think, requires uh, some explication. Right? Uh, but I think it's a, it's a big part of what has been driving the protests. Right? So, let me talk about uh, what I think are some of the dilemmas of popular organizing. Uh, this is sort of the main kind of theoretical points we're trying to draw in the book and that we've been trying to build in a variety of our work. Uh, part of this is related to how we look at the question of civil society. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this idea of civil society. It's a term that uh, you probably encountered maybe in your high school civics classes. Uh, I'm sure you've encountered it here at, in, your, in your college coursework as well. Uh, but it's actually a very imprecise term, right? We often use it to describe the activities of a whole variety of different actors, many of whom don't necessarily think of themselves as constituting uh, something like civil society itself. That's partially the strength of civil society, but it's also the weakness of it, right? If everything is civil society, then it's hard to actually know what this thing called civil society does. Right? You have to have a, a, a tremendous amount of faith uh, in the idea of civil society being a positive good uh, if you take this kind of holistic understanding of what it does and what role it plays. Right? You may think something like the Sierra Club, that is obviously civil society, and I like the environment, so civil society is great. Right? Uh, but you could also look at the NRA and say, you know, the NRA is civil society uh, and it's pro-gun control, so civil society is bad. Right? Uh, a convincing explanation for the role of civil society has to be able to uh, disaggregate the category to understand the different role that varying types of civil society actors play. Right? Uh, and this is, I think, a major point that we want to look at in the African context because civil society as a concept is not native or indigenous to the African context. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't use the language of civil society, but rather that we simply need to historicize the concept. We need to understand from where this language of civil society comes from and how it is applied or misapplied to the African context. Right? And what we sort of suggest in the book, uh, by drawing on the work of the Indian anthropologist Partha Chatterjee, uh, is that actually civil society refers to something very specific in the African context. Right? Uh, and that if we historicize the origins of civil society in Africa, what most people who refer to African civil society are referring to are actually political parties, non-governmental organizations, sometimes unions, and occasionally students in the press. Right? Essentially, the space of the sort of westernized middle class. That is the site of civil society that most resembles Western civil society, and hence it is what we think of as civil society in the African context as well. Okay? 
uh, there's a problem with this, in that it, these, this notion of civil society is actually highly exclusive. It doesn't encompass the social lives of the vast majority of Africans. Right? So as a theoretical construct, it is not particularly useful for understanding the latest wave of African protest. Yeah? Uh, what we juxtapose that against, this is again drawing on Chatterjee, uh, is Chatterjee's construct of political society. Right? What Chatterjee wants to point to uh, is a very different set of dynamics that govern the lives of Africa's poor. Right? Rather than seeking to advance their political interests by working through political parties or non-governmental organizations, Africa's poor are often uh, engaging in forms of popular protest. Yeah? Uh, what, do I, what do I mean by this? I know this is a little abstract, but I want to make sure we understand what we're trying to say. If you are somebody who believes in the concept of civil society, who thinks that political transformation can be brought about through, say, a non-governmental organization, you are adhering to a framework of rights that emerges out of a liberal contract, context. Right? So imagine if somebody comes to your house and robs you. Who do you go to? How do you achieve justice in that context? If the answer is the police, or non-governmental organization, or a local charity, right, then you are probably part of civil society. Yeah? It's very different if you are, say, a migrant from the rural areas who's squatting in a shanty town on the outskirts of a major city. If you are robbed by somebody in your neighborhood, the chances that you're going to the police are basically zero. Because if you go to the police, the likelihood is that the police will abuse you further. So you have no faith in this idea of rights. Right. So there's no point in trying to work through the channels of civil society to achieve something like your rights. Right. You have different routes through which to affect political transformation. But they are not likely to be those that are formalized. This is what we refer to as political society. Right. It is made up largely of working class people, but not only working class people. It's essentially a relationship to state power, one in which you do not believe that you have access to the liberal domain of rights. Okay? We can come back to this. All right, a second major division, and again, I won't go into this too much here, but we can talk about it later, uh, is the urban versus the rural. Right? If we look at how African societies were governed under colonial rule, there was a very strong uh, delineation between how colonial governments ruled the rural areas versus how they ruled the urban spaces. The urban spaces were defined as multi-ethnic. Right? They were essentially constructed around a set of labor relations, whereas the rural areas were defined as the site of ethnic homelands, right? whether we're talking about the Bantu states in South Africa uh, or, say, parts of Eastern Congo throughout Africa, really. Uh, the rural areas were thought as the domain of ethnicity and traditional chiefs whereas the, the urban areas were considered to be a multi-ethnic space. This has had a very impactful uh, effect on the nature of organizing in the African context. It is very difficult for urban-based social movements to penetrate the rural areas right, as a result of this fundamental division. In other words, the rural areas remain spaces that are highly ethnicized. And if you want to affect political change, you have to work through your traditional authorities. This is not true in the, rural, in the urban spaces, which tend to be much more multi-ethnic. Right? People who are moving into big cities like Lagos or Dar es Salaam or Nairobi are not able to maintain the ethnic boundaries that divide them in the more rural areas. And this poses a tremendous challenge for organizers of social movements who want to extend outside of the urban areas, which is necessary, right? because most African cities have been protest-proofed. Right? These regimes have gone to extensive lengths, and I'll show you some pictures, to try to ensure that no popular movements can emerge in urban spaces. Right? And since the rural area continues to hold the majority of African populations, it is essential for urban-based movements to try to penetrate the boundary between urban and rural if they're going to be successful uh, in advancing their objectives. Finally, and I won't say much about this, the armed struggle versus the unarmed protests, but many of these movements are confronting uh, a fundamental binary, especially in the rural areas, where young people have a number of different routes through which they can affect change. Right? Uh, many are, could be drawn into violent organizations which promise much more immediate returns, both at the individual and toward the larger political context, versus kind of the uncertain futures of nonviolent struggle. 
And so you have a lot of movements that are caught between kind of trying to challenge the state through nonviolent action, while also trying to prevent many of their members from being lured away to join violent organizations. I'll talk about this a little bit with the Congolese group called Lucha, which emerges in Eastern Congo, the site of the major wars in that country. Uh, and they are constantly confronting this challenge of how do you recruit followers into a nonviolent struggle when the same demographic that you're appealing to can also go and join a violent movement which may not be able to affect political change but may be able to put money in your pocket in a much more immediate way. Okay, so let me just talk about a few of the movements that I've studied uh, both for the book and since then. Uh, Occupy Nigeria, this is their symbol. Uh, if the name is familiar, it shouldn't be a surprise, these were actually the largest Occupy protests that unfolded in the world. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, know about the Occupy protests that unfolded in New York, uh, in Zuccotti Park. Uh, those usually brought a few thousand people out onto the streets, into this little corner of Manhattan. The Occupy Nigeria protests, in contrast, brought millions of people out into the streets in multiple cities across Nigeria. These, again, were the largest uh, by far, globally. So some of the images. Uh, very interesting set of protests. Uh, essentially collapsed after the labor unions, which were initially a part of the protests, sold out the broader movement and negotiated separate deals from the government. But like other protests, they initially started around the removal of a fuel subsidy and then morphed into a much larger call for the fall of the government itself. Uh, and then right when the protest movement was achieving a certain scale, the labor unions essentially sold out the protest movement and the movement itself collapsed. Very interesting, uh, the other picture right there uh, a lot of artists were very deeply involved with the protest movement in Nigeria. A number of the children of Fela Kuti uh, were at the forefront of the movement, and most of Nigeria has a very robust uh, Afrobeats or hip hop uh, scene, and many of the artists actually supported the protest as well. These were some protests that unfolded in Uganda uh, in 2012. This is a man named Bessie J. He was the opposition candidate. Uh, not a very successful politician, but as the protests sort of first started to emerge, he kind of became the fulcrum around which the protest movement uh, unfolded. The reason they were called the Walk to Work protests, uh, very fascinating, uh, is that the government essentially banned protest, said there can't be any gatherings of people uh, or you'll be arrested. And so the, the organizers of the movement said, okay, you know, if we can't protest, then we're all just gonna meet at the same time every day and we're gonna walk to work together. Right. Uh, so they're called the walk to work protests and you can see there uh, a crowd of people walking to work in order to get around the prohibition against protest. Uh, here is the actual leader of Uganda, a man named Yoweri Museveni, uh, who's been in power since 1986. Uh, he's on his third, fourth, fifth term, I don't know, um, but still running for office next year, I believe. Uh, you can see hey, how he's running his campaign. These are literally envelopes full of cash that he's distributing to rural constituencies. And this is in the national newspaper, right, which is actually government run. They're not, they're not hiding the nature of democracy in Uganda. This is something you can, they're pretty proud of how it works, right. Um, and here's how they responded to the protests in the end. Uh, those are American-made Humvees. Uganda is one of the closest partners of the United States in the African, Central African context. Uh, and so, you know, we sell them our Humvees and they use those Humvees to repress the protests. Uh, Bessie J himself was attacked and had to be fl flown out of Kampala to receive medical treatment. Um, this is the movement in Congo, one of the, I think, the most uh, sophisticated movements in the African context. Uh, they emerged in the eastern part of the country in a town called Goma, which has been the site of these major wars, basically going back to 1996. And as a result, this generation of young people who grew up in the kind of midst of this constant uh, war zone uh, started to take to the streets because they were disillusioned by both the government, the international community, as well as the violent groups that were promising to change everything through violence. Uh, and they started organizing a, a large set of protests around the incumbent, uh, who had been in power since the late 90s as well. Um, again, you can see what the reaction of the government has been. Uh, government cracked down on many of these protests, but ultimately the protests had some success last year. They were able to force the president to step down, though as a parting gift, he essentially uh, stole the election and passed it to a third candidate who came in uh, second. Uh, instead of the opposition figure who actually won 60% of the vote. So Lucha is still active uh, and is now trying to spread some of its strategies for organizing to other countries in the African context. Ethiopia, again, uh, the site of some of the first protests in the third wave, 
uh, one of the most authoritarian repressive governments in, in Africa, again a close US ally uh, as a result of the very robust military that has ruled that country for many decades. Uh, these were a set of protests that broke out in, in a region of Ethiopia known as Oromia. And so the government tried to discredit them by saying essentially that they were ethnic protests. Um, and as usual, tried to repress them uh, by sort of claiming that they were secessionists and hence traitorous to the Ethiopian state. Uh, I actually just want to show you this slide real quick because I think it's very useful. As you can see, this is just a map uh, of where the protests were actually unfolding. In the center there is Oromia, which is south of Addis, the capital city. But as you can tell, the protests are actually unfolding all over the country. Right? Uh, so despite the facts, the, despite the attempts by the government to ethnicize these protests, uh, they actually were national in context. And most extraordinarily, uh, as a result of these protests, uh, which were repressed very heavily for many years, last year, the government, uh, the president actually stepped down and a new president came to power who has, has promised to reform the state and to make it more democratic as a result of the pressure of these protests. So after years of trying to crush them, finally the government was forced to succumb. This is probably the most recent protest that some of you may have heard of, a uh, movement that is called Just Fall, That's All. Uh, it actually builds on an earlier set of protests that started to unfold in 2012 and 2013, organized by Sudanese students. So this is one of the movements called Grifna, which in Arabic means uh, we are fed up. Right, which became kind of a calling card for many of the protests in the African context. And they really tried to mobilize a, a broad-based movement, but were unable to really get the kind of working classes to support uh, the movement in Sudan. Sudan is a vast country, uh, size of like Western Europe, basically. Uh, and so this was a movement that was really limited to kind of urban educated students uh, from the middle classes. And despite kind of all their efforts over two years, they were never able to trigger a vast uprising in 2012 and 2013. Uh, that started to change last year, largely because of a series of protests that broke out in December in a town called Atbara, uh, which is a working class town far removed from Khartoum. Uh, and these were protests that broke out around the price of bread, right, and then quickly spread to many parts of the country and were able to bridge the sort of rural urban divide that I was talking about before, as well as the class divide, right. They were able to br bring in uh, many of, of, of Sudan's more marginal populations into the protests as well. And despite the government's efforts to suppress the protests, after four months, uh, the, the president, Omar al-Bashir, uh, who has been in power since 1989, was forced out of office. Right? Um, these were the, some images of the most recent battle protests that some of you probably heard. Uh, women were very much at the forefront of these protests. Uh, and women often from the peripheral parts of the country. So the last image I have here, uh, very extraordinary image actually. So after the president stepped down, the military basically stepped in and said, hey, you know, we got rid of him. We never really liked him anyways, uh, but we're gonna oversee the transition. And instead of dispersing, the protesters essentially have held a sit-in. So despite the fact that the president was forced out of office about a month ago, uh, the protesters have remained in front of the military headquarters uh, and are demanding that the military exclude itself from the transition process. Right? Um, and what's really extraordinary about this image is that these are actually Darfuris from Western Sudan. Uh, and so they have been at the forefront of these protests uh, and they traveled from Darfur into Khartoum and have set up these sort of camps within the protest site uh, to educate kind of people in Khartoum about the nature of the kind of repression that they have faced in Darfur over the past two decades, right? So unlike many of the protest movements, this is truly a national movement uh, and has really been insisting that any type of democratic transition that takes place cannot be simply overseen uh, by political elites, but must really bring in some of the most marginalized population, populations within the country uh, into the center of the transition process. Okay. A uh, couple of other things here, just to give you a sense of how governments in Africa have responded, largely with the support of the international community, uh, has been massive amounts of repression. This is not new. Uh, these are images from the colonial period uh, of how uh, colonial governments would respond to protests, right? as you can see, uh, simply using kind of military resources, which are ostensibly uh, procured in the name of defending the nation uh, to repress people in the nation itself. Right? Uh, here is Cairo, 2019. This is kind of the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Again, a close ally of the United States. Most of these weapons are made in the United States. Um, Egypt has become far more repressive as a result of the regime in that country that came to power after the failure of the protest movement there. Um, but the strategy of repression is not simply limited 
uh, to violence. And violence is a very crude instrument in many ways and often has the unintended effect of helping the protests grow over time, right? Uh, and so there have been a kind of a multi-pronged attempt to ensure that these protests don't unfold in different places. African governments are learning from each other, right? They are seeing what is happening to autocrats in Algeria or Sudan or Senegal or Malawi or wherever these are, Zimbabwe. Uh, and they're trying to adapt new strategies to ensure that they don't fall victim to the same forces, right? Uh, and so this is actually one of the more interesting uh, strategies that the Ethiopian regime pursued for many years. Uh, again, largely funded with international aid resources, which was to try to ensure that the city itself could not host protests, right? And how do you do this? Well, you shut down public spaces. And so they started to privatize all the public spaces uh, in the name of development. So a lot of this was paid for by Western foundations and international organizations, but essentially served the purpose of ensuring that there would be no public spaces on the theory uh, that if you take away all public spaces, there can be no more protesters, right? Really extraordinary, uh, hasn't really worked, but, but you know, this is where your tax dollars are going. Um, Infopolitics, this is a term that's sometimes used to describe the way in which social media has played into this. Uh, again, there's a very problematic narrative that tries to credit the uprisings uh, in Africa to the rise of social media in particular. Uh, that's a kind of problem that we've tried to push back against by showing this history of African protests to show that Africans have always been protesting their governments. Uh, and also to suggest that you know, the, the protests happen even despite government's efforts to shut down social media. So these are just a sampling of headlines I pulled out today from Google uh, over the past year, right? So you can see how many African countries are engaging in forms of info politics where they try to, uh, they assume that if you simply shut down social media, you can stop the protests, right? And most social media companies give governments the tools to shut down uh, their services. Uh, and again, these are not proven particularly effective, right? Even where governments have shut down social media, uh, in many of these cases, there's many more. Uh, the protest movements have only been able to uh, grow in strength over time and actually uh, force the governments out of power. Okay, let me just finish with a couple of trajectories here since I know I'm almost out of time uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, first, politically, you know, I think that there are a number of different trends. Uh, one common trend that we've seen a lot of is the idea that somehow Africa is undergoing some sort of democratic retreat, right? This is a, a theme. Uh, we hear about it globally, right? In the US, we talk about democratic retreat under Trump. Uh, in Europe, they've said the same thing under people like Viktor Orban and others. Um, and I think that there's something to that narrative, but in missing uh, uh, the bigger story, right? Which is that, in fact, the rise of popular protest movements anywhere is actually a sign of the deepening of democracy, right? It is only uh, a democratic retreat if you assume that it was democrat, that the, the elections were legitimate in the first place. Right. Um, and so while I agree that the formal indicators or indices of democracy uh, seem to be reducing in some ways, uh, I don't think we should give up hope. Right? I think that in fact, actually what we're seeing is people taking to the streets in much higher numbers than we've seen really since the 1960s. Uh, and this says something about the health of democracy in the current moment. For me, uh, it's a powerful reaction to the co-optation of democratic institutions uh, by political elites. Right? We've had this rise of conservative African nationalism, uh, and I think that's a, a common tendency as we see from India to the United States to Brazil. Um, and you know, Africa is not immune from these trends, but we shouldn't read that as a failure of democracy itself. Similarly, economically, right, there's, a, there's been this neoliberal con consensus. Part of the failure has been the ways in which opposition parties have been co-opted uh, by this electoral system. Many of the opposition parties in Africa at one point were very radical, were calling for more uh, broad transformations of the economic and political systems. Uh, and once they get brought into the electoral system, they tend to drop all of their more radical demands. This is an extraordinary disciplining. Uh, of oppositional energies, right? What is the point of an opposition if it's not actually championing uh, opposing viewpoints? Uh, and this has uh, been accompanied by a tremendous surge of inequality across Africa. Currently, seven of the 10 most unequal countries in the world are in Africa, and that includes both middle income as well as very poor countries. Uh, so the fact that opposition parties have largely stopped playing the role of opposition uh, has had very material impacts on the nature of African economic growth. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the bigger question for me is always, you know, the reality of global challenges versus the difficulty of global solidarity, right? And I want to end here with just sort of a, an image uh, 
uh, of some of the things that have been happening since these movements have really started to take off, right? Uh, you know, I think there is an increasing confidence uh, within uh, African social movements that the models that they're developing can be spread and usefully put to work uh, by movements or around the world, right? Uh, and there are efforts in place now to build a network of social movements across Africa, right? And to move away uh, from a model which sort of assumes that the West has the knowledge and then transposes that to Africa through foundations, through governments, through NGOs, uh, who then try to engage with this thing called African civil society. As a direct rejection of that, I've been involved with this uh, popular university for the education of citizens, which has set up something called the Afriki Network, uh, which in 2018 brought together 40 movements from 20 different African countries, as well as representatives from the United States, uh, black movements in the US South in particular, uh, to participate in a network that can engage in movement to movement activism, right? Rather than it being kind of a unidirectional uh, relationship between the West and Africa, this is something that centers Africa and tries to work from between movements uh, rather than movements being sort of a, a nice offshoot of kind of liberal do-gooders from the West. Right? Uh, I'll leave it at that and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much.